think the preaching this week is just as good as any conference I've ever been to. I mean, I've ever been to. It's not because of any of the preachers or any of us. I just, I really think God really has a plan for you all people. And he's led and directed in a way that is just, uh, just amazing here. Um, actually, Genesis 13. Genesis 13. I'm getting ahead of myself here. This message has changed three times this week. It's the last message always changes. Genesis 13, let's look down at, at uh, verse number 10. Verse number 10. Verse number 10. Genesis 13, verse number 10. Um, why don't you stand up, stretch your legs one more time, and I know you're tired, and uh, we're only going to be a few minutes. I want to kind of give you a challenge, and then we'll share some decisions and testimonies, give you a chance to do that publicly. And uh, let's look at verse number 10. And Lot lifted up his eyes, and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere, before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar. Read verse 11 with me out loud, ready? Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. The story here is a familiar story many of you have heard, especially if you've grown up in Sunday school. Abraham, the friend of God, had been called out of Ur of the Chaldees. God had said, I want you to go to a land that I will show thee. Abraham left without knowing where he was going, just because God told him to leave. Abraham had his family with him. His dad was with him. His nephew was with him, more than likely. Or he picked him up in Haran. I'm not quite sure where, but I think it might have been in Haran. But he left her of the Chaldees. He went up to Haran. His father died there. And then Abraham continued on with Lot and with Sarah and with all of their household. He had no children. He had Lot, though, his nephew. And they had a family. And they had a huge number of people that traveled with them. He had soldiers. He had servants. He had massive amounts of flocks. A very well-off, wealthy man. A man extremely blessed by God. One of the few men in the Bible who spoke to God verbally, face to face, so to speak. Moses was one. Abraham was one. And his reputation, God called him his friend. Amazing man. An amazing position there that uh, God chose to call Abraham and to make him his own. They traveled from Haran down through the land of Canaan, back and forth, drifting here and there, finding places for their flocks to eat, finding water for their flocks to, to drink from. And uh, they came all the way down, ended up during a famine in Egypt. After that famine was over, they left Egypt, had some baggage there. I believe some great damage was done in Egypt, in their household. And they travel on up, and they're on the top of the mountains through the middle of Israel. Jerusalem's up there. Bethel's up there. There's a mountain range going right up through, all the way up to the Jezreel Valley, all the way through Israel. And the flocks were going to the valleys and the ravines where there was grass, where there was food for them, all the way up, rocky, barren pathways that were dusty and dirty. And one day, Lot's herdsmen and Abraham's herdsmen had a conflict, the fight of the shepherds. I don't know how serious it was, but it was serious enough that Abraham felt like something needed to be done, needed to be done about it. So Abraham called Lot and said, hey, Lot, we need to have, a, we need to have a, a, a meeting here. Lot was grown. He had a family. He had his own sheep. He had his own herds. He had his own flocks. And we're talking about a grown-up man. He's there. He's got all his stuff together. He's got success. He's got wealth. He's got all that. And now there's an issue because their employees are bickering amongst one another. So Lot and Abraham meet, and Abraham says, look, Lot, it's not, not, it's not working the way it is, and we've got to do something about it. I think we should probably separate our herds, separate and go separate ways. That way we don't have these conflicts over water holes. We don't have conflicts over feed. We don't have these conflicts here. And so, Lot, why don't you choose which way you're going to go, and I'll go the opposite way. We'll put some distance here. Now, young people, just to start off, I will, I will be very honest with you. A lot of times the leader will let you choose where you're going to go because the leader, does just, the leader doesn't want conflict. And the leader lets you choose where you're going to go. And he gave Lot the choice. 
Choose which way you want to go. And Lot looked down the mountain. He saw green. All sorts of pasture. All sorts of grass. All sorts of water. And he said, he'd probably been thinking it already. Why don't we go down there? Why hasn't Uncle Abraham ever brought us down there? Our sheep would do better. We would have more water. We would have a cooler, maybe cooler environment during the summer. Maybe warmer during the winter. Why don't we live down by the river where there's plenty of good stuff down there? It looks amazing. That's a great place for us to be. I believe Abraham had been thinking that for quite a while. Abraham gave him the choice, and Lot says, well, let me think about it. You know what? I'm going to go down to the plains of Jordan near the city of Sodom. And at that moment, Lot made the worst choice he could have ever made. We're going to talk about that just a little bit. Father, I pray to help us today. I pray that this brief Challenge will help these young people to be motivated to continue on with what they decided. I pray you'd help me. I pray you'd speak through me. I pray you'd empty everything out of this room except for your presence. Help every heart to be open. I pray you'd keep the evil influence away, the, the force of Satan trying to, to block the ears and distract. I pray that you'd help the attention to be focused on your word and on these truths that we can learn from here today. In your name I pray. Amen. I want you to take your Bible, turn to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. It's way in the back. If you have no idea where it is, look on with somebody else. But let them help you find it. We don't have a lot of time. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 7. Start at verse number six. It says, In turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly. Verse seven. And delivered what? Just law. That word just means righteous. No, I've never met Lot. I don't plan to until I get to heaven someday. If I do, pray for me. Just Lot. I was reading this thinking, Lot wasn't a bad kid. He wasn't. If you know the story, uh, can we get this yellow one now? If you know the story, you got, you got Lot chooses to go down to Sodom and Gomorrah to the plains I think he chose to go carefully. I think he chose to be cautious in his choice. He'd been with his uncle Abraham for so long, I believe he knew of the dangers. He'd been warned of all the hurt and the harm of the godless society that was down in the valley. But he said, yeah, it'll be okay, I'll be careful. And so as he went down the mountain, he very carefully, I believe, took his family, his flocks, his herds, because he believed that it would be okay, he would be careful, he could handle it, and he goes down. He doesn't go to the cities. Why? No, I'm not going to the cities. I'm not going down there. I'm going to the well-watered plains. I'm going where we could have our sheep fed. I'm going where we could have our sheep water. I'm going to where they can be fat and prosperous, where we can get lots of good wool from them. We can sell all that. We can make some money. They wanted to prosper. They wanted to care for their family. All that stuff. He went cautiously and carefully down there. The problem that Lot made, and it just, well, we'll get to that. I'm getting ahead of myself. Lot went down to the valley, and just a few chapters later, look at chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18. He started out with his uncle Abraham doing great, doing amazingly, even through famine. He's successful. He's got his own flocks and herds. He's doing great. He ends up to making his own choice to go down and separate from his uncle. Chapter 19, sorry. Separate from his uncle, goes down to the low water plains of Sodom. Just several chapters later, look at chapter 19, verse 1. 
And there came two angels to Sodom at even. That's in the evening time. And Lot what? Where? Just a few chapters later, we find Lot sitting in the gate of Sodom. He worked there. He had a position there. He had a job there. And what we see is a story of a just man, a good kid, a young man who grew up in his uncle's house, who'd been taught right, who'd been warned, who'd been given every type of warning that could be given to a young person, and he decided in one day to leave Abraham and to go down because he could handle it. And he gets down to the well-watered plains of Sodom, and pretty soon Mrs. Lot needed something. And the only place that had it down there was Sodom. So he goes in by himself to Sodom. He's not going to bring his kids or his family. He goes by himself into Sodom to pick up that special hairbrush that Mrs. Lot needed. And he goes in and he finds it. And he goes in now because he knows it's a wicked place. And he knows that he shouldn't be there. And he knows that there's things there that are, are not good. And so he goes in, gets what he needs, and comes, comes back. A few weeks later, something else is needed. And they got to go sell some of their products. And, well, it, Sodom's closer than the other city. So let's go to Sodom because they have a need there. We'll make some more money there. So they bring their stuff into Sodom, but he can't go by himself, so he brings some of his older boys, maybe, maybe he brings some of his servants, and he brings them down there, and they start to sell the sheep in there, and pretty soon, they start spending more and more time visiting the city, and every single time they visit the city, they start getting desensitized to their own. Pretty soon, the thing that seemed wrong at the beginning didn't seem quite as bad. Pretty soon, the thing that he knew was hurt, going to hurt him, knew was going to be harmful, pretty soon, no longer seemed bad anymore. And pretty soon, family needed to go to dinner, and so let's go to Steak and Shake. I'm sure they have a Steak and Shake. We have one that I know of in Victorville. They go to Steak and Shake in Sodom. And so Lot brings Mrs. Lot and his daughters and his sons, and they go in to Steak and Shake. Pretty soon, the people of Sodom start to see the Lot is prospering. They start to get to know him, starts making some friends in the city. And pretty soon, those people said, hey, you're a good guy. You're a just man. You could really be a help to us in the city. We'd like to give you a position sitting in the gate, judging people, taking care of people's problems. Lot says, man, I could do a lot of good here. And pretty soon Lot is sitting in the gate of Sodom. In just a few short years, Lot goes from being with Abraham in a holy place, in a godly place, with a holy altar, worshiping and sacrificing to God in a wonderful place, completely protected, all the way to sitting in the midst of horrible debauchery. If you know the story, God comes down with, uh, with some angels, and the angels are going to go destroy the city. And they're going to go down and they're going to see in the city. And Abraham makes a deal with God. And he barters back and forth with God. And Abraham says, God, if there's 100 righteous in the city, would you destroy the city for 100 righteous? God says, no, I wouldn't do it for 100 righteous. And Abraham says, oh, okay, God, that's, that's, that's really good to hear. Um, God, what if there's only 50 righteous? Would you spare the city? Abraham knew. Abraham knew there wasn't anybody good in that city. And he's getting God down. And finally said, if there's 10 righteous people in the city, would you spare the city? Because Abraham is thinking about his nephew Lot. And Abraham's thinking about Lot's family. And Abraham's thinking about all the people he loves that are down there that he's been hurting for. And that he's been, that he's been praying for. And that he's been hoping that they'll come out of the city. And he's thinking about all of them. Thinking about all of their lives destroyed by the wrath of God and the curse of God. And he gets all the way down to 10 righteous people. And there's not even 10 righteous righteous people in the city. The Bible still calls Lot a just man. It gets so bad, the angels come down to the city. The whole city is so perverse. All the men in the city, the perverted, horrible, homosexual crowd of men in that city, see the two men come into the city and they come to Lot's house and tell him to send out the men. Wicked, horribly perverse. And Abraham says, no, no, don't do that. Take my two daughters. That's how horrible a good kid became. Young people, this isn't the subject of the message. Just because you're a good kid doesn't keep you out of sight. Let me tell you the problem. The problem wasn't Sodom. The problem wasn't the evil people. The problem wasn't the Green Valley. The problem wasn't the well-watered plains. You know what the problem was? 
Lot left is Abraham. Right. Amen. That was the problem. Now, young people, you've got to face something in life. If you're going to succeed as a young person, if you're going to succeed as a college student, if you're going to succeed as a young adult, if you're going to succeed as a married adult, if you're going to succeed as an older adult, if you're going to succeed as a senior citizen, I don't care what stage of life you're in, if you're going to succeed, let me tell you, there's one thing that you need in your life that's going to help you all the way through your life is you need an Abraham. You need somebody in your life that you're going to stick with. So many people in life in Christianity, they go through their life and they think, I can do it. I know. I've been taught. I've got control of it. I can handle it. I can do all this on my own. I can make these decisions on my own. And we decide to step away from the Abraham or the Abrahams in our life, the ones that were there to help us through life, the ones that were there as a, as a cornerstone in our life that would help keep us right. And we step away from the Abraham. We turn our back on Abraham and we go down and always, always when you go away from your Abraham, you go on a downward spiral. That's right. The Abraham is so important in your life. We read other stories about the same thing, about people who left their Abraham. In Numbers 25, God tells the Israelites that they are supposed to vex the Midianites and smite them. It says, for they vex you with their wiles. And we're going to talk about this just a minute. In 2 Peter, God says that they deliver, ju and deliver just lot vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. To vex means to exhaust, to tear down, and to torment. To exhaust, to tear down, and to torment. Now, this whole message came about because of all the decisions that have been made today. You guys have made great decisions all through camp. Today, you've got decisions written in your book. You shared testimonies last night. You've made awesome, amazing decisions. God spoke in your heart about, and you've made those decisions here. But as soon as you get home, what's going to happen is the devil's going to start vexing you. He's going to start exhausting your strength. You, you're just determined. You got that message on Tuesday night. You got to have determination to make your decision stick. And you're going to go home determined. You're going to go home excited. You're going to go home all oh, gung home for God. I'm going to do this. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to get rid of my phone. I'm going to give my parents full accountability. I'm going to go to all this stuff. I'm going to do these decisions. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go on through with all my determination. And the devil's going to start vexing your determination. The devil's going to start chipping away at it. The devil's going to start going, and he's going to start eating away at you little by little by little. And that's what God says that the Canaanites were going to do to the Israelites in Numbers chapter 25. He says if you don't drive them out, if you don't get rid of all of them, they're going to vex you with their wiles, wherewith they have beguiled you. And Joshua read another story, Joshua 9 and 3, about the Gibeonites. You know the story about the Gibeonites. Joshua and the Israelites are commanded to go in and to destroy or drive out every single person in the land of Canaan. These people were horrible, filthy, vile people. God had no mercy on them. He said, it's all done. My mercy is all gone. My warnings have all been unheeded. And you're sacrificing your children, burning them alive on the altar of Molech. You are, have no regard for life. You have no regard for the children. You have no regard for me. Your life is full of immorality and indecency. You have witchcraft. You have all the sorts you have all that stuff, and I'm done with you. You're gone. And God used the Israelites to punish them and drive them out. And so God told Joshua, go in. You don't spare anybody. If they're afraid of you and they run away, good for them. But if they don't go away and they stay there, then you destroy every single person. Because of their wickedness. Joshua goes in, the Gibeonites, they get a plan together. They dress up like they're from far away. They put on old, tattered, dirty shoes. They put on old garments, look like they've been traveling for months. They've got bread in their bags that are already dry and moldy. They've got uh, old wineskins. They, they completely disguise themselves as somebody coming from far away. They came to Joshua and they said, oh, we've heard about you. and We love your God and, and we just want to come and we want to say good job on what you're doing and we just want to make a, make a league with you. And so, there's so many bad people around here and it's finally good to have somebody like you around the area and we're coming. No, I'm adding all that in. You guys know the story. No, I'm adding that in. They came in and Joshua, for some reason, he says, oh yeah, that's good. Let's do it. Got the elders of Israel together. And they made a league with the Gibeonites. They signed a treaty in God's name on behalf of them. And once that treaty was signed, it could not be broken at all. And they found out the Gibeonites lived right over the hill. Those Gibeonites caused trouble to Israel all the way through Saul and King David. 
500 years plus. Those Gibeonites were a thorn in their side. And it happened because they disguised themselves and they came in and very subtly and slyly came in to get the Israelites deceived and tricked. They're young people. The devil's going to come into your life and very slyly and with many wiles, many sneaky plans. He's going to come slipping in and start looking and getting you to think about it. He's going to start thinking, ah, oh, it's not a big deal. It's not that big. I know I decided that at camp, but now that I'm home, it's like, oh, it's not that big of a deal. He's going to start slyly slipping people in and slipping friends in and slipping media in and slipping any type of influence that can into your life to get you stripped of your decisions. Well, do you know why Joshua made a lead with the Israelites? He didn't go to his Abraham. It would have saved Israel a whole lot of trouble had Joshua been with his Abraham. But Joshua didn't go to God. Joshua didn't go to the tabernacle. Joshua didn't go to the place where God would have spoken to him. And God would have said, Joshua, these people are from right over the hill. Go and kill them all. But Joshua got away from his Abraham. We have another story. In Titus chapter, I'm sorry. We have another story. In Titus 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 26. Talks about a, a, some young people, some churches. So in some churches, it says that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. It's talking to Timothy. Paul's talking to Timothy about people in his church and in other churches who get to the point where they are so vulnerable to the attack of Satan and the wiles of the devil that at Satan's will, he just comes and takes them captive. Well, I can tell you they're taken captive at his will because they didn't have an Abraham. They didn't have somebody that they were going to stick with in every area of their life to go to to say, is this a good idea? Please tell me yes or no. We get down to Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Then he said unto the woman, yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. He goes on, some of you heard in the session yesterday about Eve looking. You see, is there any mention of Eve going to Adam? None. She didn't go to Adam and say, hey, I met this serpent. He's talking to me. He says this fruit's good. What do you think? No, she got away from her Abraham. She heard Adam tell her what would happen if they ate the fruit. And she decided that instead of sticking with Abraham, or her Adam, her Abraham, instead of sticking with him, that she could make the decision on her own. And in her own mind, the devil got her to think that actually what she was doing was a good thing. I'll tell you what, if she was with Abraham, she wouldn't have made that decision. That's right. That decision brought every single bit of sin into this world. You see, your decision to get away from your Abraham will hurt you horribly. I was talking to some people these just this week at camp about people in the past who chose to get away from God and get away from their Abraham. They made horrible decisions that today so many people, it is unbelievable how many people are still being hurt on a regular basis today because somebody chose to get away from their Abraham and they chose to well water plains, they chose the, the water, they chose the grass, and the devil very slyly slipped them into Sodom before they even realized they were in a mess. It's all because they didn't have an Abraham. 2 Corinthians 11.3 But I fear lest by any means as a serpent beguile Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Do you know why Paul was warning these people? That they would be corrupted because these people weren't close to their Abraham. They didn't have one. They should have had one. They had a pastor there. They had somebody they could have gone to, but these people were all in the same category that so many teenagers are in. We know better. We know best. We don't need anybody. We can do it in our own strength. Well, let me tell you something today. Every single worker in this room, every single adult in this room has an Abraham. If every single adult in this room has an Abraham, because we know we can't do it without our Abraham, how in the world are you going to decide to do it without an Abraham? You can't do it. There's no way you can do it. So young people, all the decisions you've made. If you don't have an Abraham in your life, 
It's not going to last very long. That's right. Every single decision, you need to have someone in your life that you can go to with every choice in your life. And let them help you make it. Uh, Genesis 18, verse 18 and 19 is something that God says about Abraham. It will help you decide who your Abraham should be. Some of you, it should definitely be your parents. Your parents should definitely be your Abraham. Some of you, it should be your pastor. It should be your pastor. Some of you, maybe you don't have parents. Maybe you don't really know your pastor. You're not comfortable going to your pastor. Maybe he's scary. I don't know. Uh, go, go to your youth pastor. Go to your Sunday school teacher. Go to someone in the church that you know that is a godly, God-fearing person who you can run decisions by. You need an Abraham. Look at this. God said this about Abraham. 18 verse 18 says, Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord. Let me explain something about an Abraham. Abrahams aren't always nice. They're not. They're not. I wish Abrahams were all nice and cuddly and fuzzy and good feely people, but they're not. Sometimes an Abraham's going to come up to you and say, what are you doing? Knock it off. Because they care about you, they because they care so much about you, they care less about making you feel good. And they care less about you being their friend. They care more about you making a wise decision and a right decision. They care about how you behave. They care about what you do. So when you go home, some of you are gonna go home, you're gonna get an Abraham. You're gonna get an accountability person. Don't be don't be offended when they come up and say, knock it off. There's some young people that, you know, oh, would you please help me? And then the first time that the Abraham says, hey, no, stop. You're being foolish. You're like, oh, you hurt my feelings. And they go away. Abrahams aren't always nice. Abrahams will command to go the right way. Sometimes you're going to hear preaching that's just going to, that's just going to, that's just going to irritate you up and down all the way to head to toes. You're going to hear something that you disagree with. Your pastor's going to preach on something. There's going to be teen activity. And the preacher's going to get up and rip on something that, that you know is wrong, but you just don't agree. You don't understand. You don't see. Well, let me tell you something. If you're, if, you're, if you're serious about your decision, you're going to have to decide that's the Abraham. And if he's preaching that this is wrong, I'm just going to have to accept him at he, that he knows what he's talking about or that she knows what she's talking about. And I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and let them help me by yielding to what they told me to do. Because God knew that Abraham would command his children and his household after. And let me tell you this. With an Abraham, there's three things that are going to happen in your life. If you stick with your Abraham, first of all, find an Abraham. You've got to have one settled in your head and in your heart. Who is it going to be? You might have, have, you might have two. You might have three. You might have people that are in your life. Your pastor should definitely be one of them. Your parents should definitely be one of them if you have parents that will help you in that right way. For sure, you need to have a good relationship with your parents. Uh, anybody else, if you have a good lady who's a Sunday school teacher in the youth department in the church, an adult class teacher, go to them. Pick somebody. You need to have an Abraham. But when you have an Abraham, there's three things that will happen. Number one, you will win the battle. Amen. That's a promise. I guarantee you. You struggle. You, you've been vexed. You've been tormented. You, 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 you've gotten things right now, and you felt that torment. You knew what you were doing is not right. You knew it wasn't happy. You were making you happy. You knew the things that you were doing were wrong. You had guilt in your heart. You had conviction in your heart, and you finally got it right. Well, let me tell you something. Right now, you make the decision to camp. You're up on the mountain with Abraham, but the devil's going to try to work on you and get you away from him. So let me tell you right now, with an Abraham, if you stay up with Abraham, number one, the promise, you will win the battle. You won't lose it. You stick close to your Abraham, you're going to win the battle. Number two, you will make good decisions. Sometimes the decision you need help with is not about your battle. Sometimes it's just about making good decisions. And when you have an Abraham that's helping you in the fight and in the battle, and you know you're winning the battle, there are other decisions that are going to come along as a benefit. You're not going to go and know what school to go to. 
You're not going to know what, what choice to make, what person to date. You're not going to know where to go or how to do it. Or, or if you have questions, you need somebody to go to. With an Abraham, you're going to make good decisions. Proverbs 2.20 commands it. says that thou mayest walk in the way of good men and keep the paths of the righteous. Why? Because with it comes blessing. With it comes success and honor. Preacher talked about being prosperous last night with this. Number three, you will have help in the fight. If you have an Abraham, you know that you, have, you can have confidence that when you face a struggle in life, you will have somebody right there to help you. Young people, so, some of the dumbest decisions young people make are because they are hurt, they are hurting, they are being attacked, and they have nobody to help them. You take, you take a druggie. And they go through rehabilitation and they go through some reformers unanimous or some program like that. One of the things that helps them the most is when they have somebody that in the middle of temptation, in the middle of the attack, they can pick up the phone and call 24 hours a day. That's, good. That's what you need. I'm not a druggie. You might as well be. Because sin is worse than any drug. Amen. Temptation, lust, greed, selfishness, insecurity, whatever it is, it will eat away at you and take control of your life just like any bit of cocaine, any bit of any other drug, any bit of alcohol. It will take control of your life and destroy you. And you know what you're struggling with. You know what attack's going to come. You can expect it to come. And when you have an Abraham, you're going to have somebody there right there to help you with it. First Timothy 6, 11. He says, But thou, O man of God, flee these things. So let me explain this, because it's not just teenagers. This is Paul talking to Timothy, the pastor. He's saying, Timothy, you're not going to make it if you don't flee these things. You see, Paul was Timothy's Abraham. And Timothy and Paul were very close. And Timothy, the pastor, had to have an Abraham remind him, hey, stay away from these things that are going to corrupt you. So young people, it's not about you as teenagers. It's about Christianity in general. It's about me. If I don't have help, I will fail. He said, Brother Josh, why, why is Bray telling us that? Because I know you. As a teenager, you get to the point where you think, oh yeah, I know I've been taught and I can make all these decisions on my own. When you get to that point, you are on a very slippery slope because your decisions might turn out, might turn out very badly. But when you have somebody you can go to and say, hey, what do you think about this? Is it a good idea? Do you think of something else I should do that would be better? And you go to them with a humble spirit, a yielded spirit, saying you are the one that I go to, the one to help me with my problems, with my decisions. Your percentages of success just skyrocketed through the roof. So let me, young people, let me ask you this. This is not a bombastic message. It's not a great life-changing message. It's just something I, I, think, I think will help you if you go home realizing the importance of having someone in your life that you go to. Last thing, and we're going to close. Your Abraham should not ever be a peer. Your peers are just as dumb as you are. Should never be a peer. But they're a good kid. Where do we start out? With Lot, the good kid. But they're, they're a good Christian. Where do we start out? With Lot, called righteous by God. Can I just have some, I'm just going to surround myself with some really good friends. That's a great thing. I'm all, I'm all for that. But they can't be your Abraham. The moment you start going to your peers and start saying, hey, what do you think about this? What do you think I, where do you think I should go? Where do you think I should, what do you think I should do? What Bible college should I go to? Uh, slippery slope here. Because you just removed yourself from an Abraham. The young people, if you could, in, with the decisions you've made, some of you made some awesome decisions this week. Life-changing decisions. Not life-changing, life-saving decisions. Right. Yep. Yep. If you want to continue down that path, we've already talked a lot of you about it by having an Abraham. 
having an accountability person, somebody who keeps you accountable, holds you accountable. If you want to continue down that path, you can't ever let that person go. Never. That person might change as you get older, but you cannot let them go. So as you go home today, you've got to make one last decision. And this decision will save you. I'm going to find an Abraham. And I'm going to go to them with everything. When I'm tempted, when I'm struggling, when I feel temptation coming, I'm going to go to them. Because a lot of you, the other decisions you made won't last two days. Unless you've got somebody that you're going to with. Find somebody that you can go to and stick it out. Every church is different. Every church has different people. Every church has different pastors, youth workers, youth pastors. Every church has different people you can go to. But you've got to make a decision. You're going to have an Abraham in your life. If you don't have an Abraham in your life, you're going to fail. How do I know that? Because if I don't have an Abraham in my life, I will fail. I can't do it on my own. I'm not wise enough. I'm not smart enough. I am not good enough to do it on my own. Neither are you. Amen. Every worker in this room would be in agreement with this. Young people, we see it. We hurt for you. And we want you to make it. When we hear all the decisions, and every year it's the same, all sorts of decisions. Since people made decisions last year who are not even in church anymore. Your decisions are only going to matter if you have somebody there to help you in the battle, to help you make good decisions, to keep you from being overcome. And they will if you give them the chance. Father, pray for these young people. Watch over them, please. We didn't want to make a, a last day with no extra push or emphasis. And so many good messages. So many encouraging messages. And Pastor Cowling's on Monday about I can do all things. Brother Aldez on Tuesday night about making decisions, the importance of it. And Pastor Garner and Brother Cowling again and all the split sessions and all the morning preaching. A lot of things about eyes, a lot about the heart. And then the young people with soft hearts this week, gotta, they need you, they need your help. Pray you wouldn't let go of them. Pray as they go home, you continue in their hearts. Convict them, please. Let them get somebody they can be accountable to in every decision they make. Help them get close to their parents. Pray help them be close to to good friends and that they would do what's right and they'd stick it out that they'd stand strong in the choices that they've made young people this is your chance here today last chance to come to an altar reaffirm your decisions if you made a decision Monday night Tuesday night come back to an altar and tell God you're serious about it if you're not serious stay in your seat but if you're serious about it Come down an old-fashioned altar, get on your knees, tell God you're serious about it, that you want to keep it, that you want to do right, with His help as the piano plays. Let's all stand.